the, uh, if you didn't notice, the, the words to that song the choir just sang are printed in your worship guide there. Read those through. It's a beautiful hymn. Thank you, choir, very much. Uh, we will get to Deuteronomy 6 in a few minutes. You could turn there now to avoid the rush if you wanted to. <laughs> Traffic's not too bad in Wilmore, though, so you'll be all right. First 12 verses of Deuteronomy 6. The word mission has come up quite a bit around here recently. Um, The last two weeks, we focused on world missions, God's call for his church to join him in inviting all peoples, all nations to himself. Uh, That's always been God's mission. Originally, he, he shared it with Israel. He asked the Hebrews to live before the nations of the world in such a way that would reveal who he is as the one true God to them. Uh, And of course, that's now God's mission for all who know Jesus, his son. Uh, We're to invite those around us into relationship with God by becoming disciples of Jesus. We talked about that part of the mission a few weeks ago. Our work, our mission, as Jesus put it in Matthew 28, is to make disciples. And remember, we said disciples are doers of Jesus' words, not hearers only. Make disciples, Jesus said, of all nations, baptizing them, inviting them to lives of faith, and then teaching them to obey everything he said. Our mission, the church's Mission, the work of current disciples, is to join God in making more disciples, new disciples. Is that possible? Are are disciples being made in our day? Some people wonder that. Well, it must be possible. If it were not possible, God would not ask us to do it. To ask the impossible is something only a tyrant would do, and God is no tyrant. So, so disciple making is definitely mission possible, but how is it done? Uh, How are disciples made and what is our part in it? This is where theory becomes reality, isn't it? Uh, This is, this is what you call practical theology. Uh, There's biblical theology. There's uh, uh, systematic theology. There's a lot of different theology, studies of theology. This is practical theology. How do you and I fulfill the mission of making disciples? The church has explored that question countless times through the ages. And and there is really no quick, simple answer to it. In fact, the process of making a disciple of Jesus is about as unique as as the making of a person himself or herself. By God's design, we are all so different that there could never be just one simple prescription for disciple-making, which is why even though many have tried to write the definitive book or program or curriculum on discipleship, and many of those are very, very good and very, very helpful, none are really all-encompassing. We are too complex of creatures to fit neatly into simple little slots. Just the same, though, there are principles of discipleship that cut across the human spectrum. And when they are applied to persons in, in the right measures, making disciples is very much possible. If it were impossible, none of us would be here. This Deuteronomy passage gives us at least one disciple-making principle. And and I'm going to call it realize and remember. And all it means is to learn, to realize the values and the character of God, and then remember them. Remember them. Keep them ever before us in thought and in life. Realizing And remembering, that is a principle of discipleship. Now, to realize involves, of course, an educational component. Uh, 
we have to learn what is and what is not the character of God. We have to learn the values of God, the principles of God, what are important to him. We've got to learn that. That was part of the idea of the Old Testament law. In order to realize who this God was, the people of Israel had to learn about him. They had to get to know him because they didn't know him. They didn't know much about him. So they were wondering, you know, who is this God who is leading us through this desert? You know, is he for telling the truth or is he for lying? Does he value life or does he not value life? Is, is he the only God or, or is he just one of many? Is he consistent or does he change? Is he a different person tomorrow morning when we wake up? Is he out for the good of his creation or is he out to take advantage of his creation? What is good to him? What is important to him? What is valuable to him? They didn't know that stuff about God. So the answers to all those sorts of questions and a lot more came with the law that God gave to Moses. That was God's way of of, of revealing himself to his people so they could realize who he was. And then came the remember part, uh, which is probably the bigger challenge of the two. (laughs) Uh, I was reading this the other day, this magazine from St. Joe Hospital. Some of you get it, probably did. Uh, There's an article in here about memory, about expert care for aging brains. Hmm. Uh, It says, the article says that for every year past our 65th birthday, we lose seven cubic centimeters of brain tissue that usually affects the memory, right? Some of you think, I've lost more than that before 65. We have problems remembering. I don't have to tell you that. We have problems remembering. And the fall, of course, is responsible for that and all the limitations that come with our problems with remembering. We can't even remember things like we were created by God to do. We can't even remember like we were created to do. And we all know this. And so we've all created some sort of mechanism to remind us about things, haven't we? We know this. The calendars that you keep, uh, the alarms that we set, our clocks, our phones, our schedules. Some of us have secretaries or assistants, even our spouses or, or our kids. They all help us remember important things like anniversaries and birthdays. <laughs> God understands that. God understands our need for help in remembering even what we have learned about him. And that's why he says there in verses 6 through 8, these commandments that I give you this day, impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands. Bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. See, God is saying, make sure you talk about what I have revealed to you about myself. Talk about those things with your kids, with your family, with each other, with other God followers. He says, talk about it wherever you are. You're at home, you're at work, you're on traveling, wherever you are. Talk about these things morning and night, whenever you can. He wants us to take every opportunity to realize the character of God that we observe, that we see in life, that we see in persons, that we see in situations, in creation, in beauty, in truth, in virtue, make the connection that when we see something beautiful, oh, that is of God. That is of God. Verbalize it. Affirm it. Mark it. Mark God's character and principles across our lives. Wherever and however we can, God wants us to keep godliness before our consciousness. God says we need to do this, in fact, because, of course, the fallen world around us takes every opportunity to exalt godlessness and pushes it into our lives. Thanks to the fall, you know, none of us have to work particularly hard to see brokenness, do we? Or falsehood 
or corruption, <laughs> particularly in an election year. You can see it pretty easily. We don't have to work to see the godlessness in our world. We couldn't avoid it if we tried. But we do have to work to realize and remember who God is and what he values. And if we will do that, if we will do the work involved in realizing it and remembering it, then godliness will be, Moses says to us there in verse 6, impressed upon our hearts. Impressed upon our hearts. If we will participate in this sort of active remembering that God's speaking of here, who God is, what he values, then that will actually become a part of us. And that is what God is after. That is what he's after. That's actually the real core of discipleship. God's character, God's values, driven deeply into persons. That is us, human beings, becoming who God made us to originally be. We're already made in his image. We are created in his image. The fall distorted that image. But the goal of discipleship is the restoration of his image. God's image recreated in us in all its glory so persons might become fully human again. The goal of discipleship. Now that could only happen to a limited degree in Moses' day. Israel lacked the power to see it happen thoroughly. But because of God's spirit in our world today, it is completely possible. The the inner transformation, the recreation of persons is why God sent his spirit to earth. He is here to empower disciples, Christ followers, to actually embody God's character God's values to become like Jesus from the inside out. So we can truly fulfill this great commandment that's given here in verse 5 and that Jesus later repeats, you know, to love God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. God's spirit enlivens and empowers our realizing and remembering Such that we can love God, we can love what he loves, and we can love like he loves. The Spirit provides the power for making our realizing and our remembering effective. The Spirit provides the power for making that effective. The Spirit does not take the place of the work involved in realizing and remembering. Those are still things we need to do if we want to be disciples. And if we want to participate in God's disciple-making mission. That's why we take all the opportunities we can to learn of God. You know, classes, Bible reading, Bible study, books, uh, personal devotions, listening to, to other believers' wisdom and experiences, letting as much Christian influence into our lives as possible. That's why the church here offers all that we offer, <laughs> Times of learning, listening, serving. That's why we encourage and try to resource personal devotions and study and prayer. It takes time. It takes effort to learn. It takes time and effort to realize who God is and what he's like. And that is true all of our lives long. You know, you don't graduate from that. Uh, There's always more to God to discover. There's always new realities about God that lie ahead of us. No matter how long we followed him, there are always new things about God for us to realize. And then the remembering part, you know, that's the importance of worship and community and connection and Christian, this word fellowship. It's a churchy word. That means to some degree hanging out with other Christ followers, hanging out with other disciples. But it is not just a mindless kind of hanging out. I mean, a lot of people hang out mindlessly. You know, you don't think about what you're doing, who you're with. 
This is not that. Fellowship is hanging out with a purpose. The purpose of fellowship is of intentionally remembering together, calling to mind the things of God. Fellowship is disciples connecting to help one another remember what we have realized about God. It's it's the rehearsing together of God's character and God's values so those truths might settle deep into our our hearts. And that's why the church gathers multiple times a week. It's why all these different groups are offered and why we encourage mentoring and why we do retreats, why we send our teens on retreat and camp and these different group outings. Um, why we advertise all the great opportunities that we have around, especially here in Wilmore, for Christian fellowship. It's why we do that. Fellowship, if done well, is a major driver of remembering. And that is a huge part of discipleship. Take every opportunity to learn of God and then to rehearse together what you've learned. That's what Moses is saying here. In Deuteronomy 6. And that is a principle of making a disciple. When we talked about this series, um, the, three, the three pastors, we're each going to share in this. Um, I forget. Dwight and Caitlin preach the next two weeks. I forget who preaches when. They haven't forgotten. <laughs> but, but, I, but I have. Uh, And part of it is just to talk a little bit about how discipleship has worked in our lives. Um, This uh, this has worked this way in my life. Um, Growing up, we were in church at just about every opportunity. Uh, There weren't there weren't many uh, uh, kid and teen programs. We had we had a, a, a much smaller church than than this. But my parents took advantage of every one of them. Um. I don't imagine that they really even thought about it as discipleship at the time. Going to church is just what we did. Uh, But I see now that all of those learning and connecting experiences were incredibly formational to me. Uh, So much of my early realization of God and his character and his word and what was important to him came from mostly old women, Sunday school and Wednesday night teachers who chose to invest in, far more often than not, a pretty unruly kid. Uh, Also, our family almost always had breakfast and supper together. That's just what you did. And again, I don't think my parents were, were so much intentional about it, The fact is, the things we talked about around the table would often come back to something about God. Uh, What was good, what was not good, what was right, what was not right. Just just praying for the meal set the tone that God was present there. And that's part of realizing who God is. He is there. And when a group has the ability to communicate in a setting like that, it's, it's not the same. As, as just going and watching your kid play sports. You don't talk to your kid when your kid's playing sports or in a band, marching in a band. It's when you're together around the table, something happens. The fellowship component for me growing up really happened with my extended family. My dad's family was large and close And all part of the same church. So family gatherings were church gatherings. And church gatherings were family gatherings. So uh, not only was I surrounded by good influences, church and family wise. I was also surrounded by people who would not hesitate to tell on me if I did something wrong. (laughs) Uh, Now let me say, though I did not always appreciate it then. That sort of pressure is a very good thing. It kept me from doing a ton of stupid stuff. It seemed like there were eyes on me everywhere. Everywhere I went, eyes that my parents appreciated. And that I, as a parent, (laughs) now appreciate. Um, Unlike a lot of parents today who think their kids are just perfect, 
My parents knew that I was not. And I needed a lot of deputies keeping watch over me. And in our church and in our family, there were a lot of deputies. And that was okay. And in all the craziness and the immorality that was part of my high school experience, it was my cousins and it was my family and their threat of exposure, frankly, that kept me moored. Moored. I learned this. If, if a kid has just one true Christian friend, and, and mine was happened to be a cousin. We went to church together. We were in the family, you know, and we were a year apart in school. If a kid has just one true Christian friend, if there is just one person in a kid's life who is not afraid to say, don't do that dumb thing. If every young man or woman could just have one friend like that to walk through seasons of life with, they can make it through anything. Having and being that sort of friend is part of discipleship. Um, Though I grew up in church, I didn't really have a personal relationship with Jesus until college. I was 19 when I truly met Jesus in in a personal way. But you know, I'll tell you this. Once I received Jesus, then all of that learning about God that I did as a kid, it all came into focus. Almost immediately. Uh, It was something, it was like, it was like something was turned on and all of those random knowledge and and things, uh, it just, it just all came into order. That's what actually knowing Jesus can do. Um, It's been 36 years since then. uh, And the Lord has used, is my math right? Yeah, that's right. Um, Some of you like, hmm? Uh, The Lord has used a whole variety of things in different seasons of my life for different lengths of time in my own discipleship. I can I can see that people, couples, families, uh, different groups that I've been a part of, studies I've been a part of, books that I've read, classes I've taken, life experiences, both good and bad, uh, friends, strangers, Annette, our boys. God's used all these to disciple me. In different ways. And and see, that's the thing about individuals. In his grace, God adapts his methods to fit us. To teach us what he needs for us to know. There's some people that just want to say, well, discipleship has to look just this way. I would say, that is just not so. If you're willing, if we're willing to be learners and recollectors... If we will put ourselves in positions where we can realize and then remember, there is no end to the means and methods God will use to grow us up in him. There's no end. His spirit is not in any way limited to a certain book or schedule or methodology. I've learned that. At times, God has used a stranger's comment to teach me more about him than a a semester-long class. And then again, he's used classes, college and seminary classes, to fill in the blanks in in rich and important ways. Really, it's it's the willingness and the availability of the heart that he's looking for. Because though he does work through persons and programs, really, God's spirit is the capital D disciple maker who's working in and through, and sometimes he works in spite of all of the small d disciple makers in his church. Um, I know that, and and I'm counting on that, especially with my kids. If you have kids, they are your first and foremost mission field. Uh, Annette and I have tried to be intentional about providing our kids opportunities for both realizing God's character and values and also remembering, reinforcing those truths so that they might sink deep into our boys' souls. We've not done it perfectly, but we've done our best. Um, whether or not I, I would, was the pastor, we would have had our kids right here in this place at every opportunity because they need every encounter with godliness they can get. And... We made consistently connecting with our boys whenever we could, but especially over meals, we made that a priority. 
We have tried to make a point of seeing God's hand and truth in our lives and of remembering him with them. And through the years, many of you have joined us in both of those pursuits, and we are very grateful. We are very grateful. But, um, you know, as much as Annette and I have done and have not done, we know God is far more interested in our kids' discipleship than even we are. And he's working in ways that we haven't and in in many ways that we can't. We can no longer work in, in their lives. I know that as long as their hearts are open, as long as their hearts are willing, just as he did with me, God's spirit will disciple them through their relationships, through their own studies, in in the classes they're taking in this particular season of their lives. And he will do it directly through his still small voice. That is what God does. He empowers our efforts, and then he keeps on. He keeps on working and shaping and molding and correcting and encouraging, even when we can't. He says things that we cannot say. He works through people and circumstances. He also works directly through his spirit, the voice of his spirit, to help anyone who is truly open and seeking to become and to make disciples of Jesus. Um, He's the greater partner in all this, (laughs) and we can count on him. Disciple is ours to work at in ourselves and in those that he's charged us to disciple, but we can also trust that God is going to do the greater part. He will do it. So I need to ask you this in, in closing. Do you faithfully put yourselves in positions where you can realize who God really is? Do you, do you, do you make yourself available to God like that? And then are there mechanisms in your life set up to help you remember? Is there some new step that God is asking you to take in your own discipleship or maybe in your efforts to disciple someone else? Don't be afraid to take it. If he's asking you to take it, don't be afraid to take it. You can trust that it's for good. Because he always works for good. God wants us all to be disciples. He wants us all to participate in his making of disciples. And he'll show us how if we'll walk willingly with him. Lord, would you show us how uh, to be more like you ourselves and to help others become more like you? If there's one or two things that you you are calling us to do, calling us to change, uh, steps that we need to take to do this, would you show us, would you drive those into our hearts, reveal those to us in these days? We ask in your name, Jesus.